Thank you everyone for coming today um, for our fifth conversation about rising. The, the idea started when I first uh, came at Boston Rising and, and Tiziana and I were going on these series of conversations with people talking about what we were thinking about in poverty, talking about what we've learned and where we were coming from. And I, I was thinking it would be fantastic if there, were, there could be other people who could hear these conversations. If there could be flies on the walls to participate and hear the things that I was hearing. And I was feeling blessed to hear all this information and this wisdom. And Tiziana was coming back, and when it was just really four of us, we were coming back and sharing all this wisdom with each other. And it would be great if I could have been at that conversation, or it would have been great if she could have been at that conversation. And so the idea of having conversations in a fishbowl where everyone could participate was, was born, and that was 18 months ago. The reason that we have them in our kitchen, because I remember when I was growing up, the, the real conversations happened in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. and so if I didn't make, uh, if I had those bad grades, a teacher called home, and my mom or dad called me to the kitchen, I knew it was going to be a serious <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so it was a kitchen conversation. Or, or when I was growing up, grown folks used to go in the kitchen and they used to talk and, and, and have these grown people conversation. If you were young and you were from down south, you know when there were grown folks conversations going on in the kitchen your job was to listen to the sidelines and not participate, but you were to learn everything that you need to know about what was going on by standing in the doorway of the kitchen. And so we want to have authentic kitchen conversations where people could be flies on the wall, with the trick being you actually get to participate. So like Brittany said, it's a participatory conversation. I have seven questions, I'm gonna be honest, I've never gotten through any of the questions in any of these conversations. Uh, I, I urge you to, to ask questions and interact um, and, and have our speakers talk back to you and, and have this be a really a learning conversation. The conversations are centered about rising and here's what we know about rising at Boston Rising. There have been three things historically that people have used to rise in America. Those have been education, folks go to public schools in the United States of America, grow up, get that job, live happily ever after. Education was a tool for people in America to rise. It's one of the institutions that make this country what it is. A job, uh, in my father's day and in my grandfather's day, um, you can work at a place, whether it be the custodian, the, the bookkeeper, or the shopkeeper, work a job for 30, 35 years, get that gold watch and retire, and raise a family off your wages from that job. It was an institution, you belonged to a company, you were a company person. Uh, jobs were tools for rising. Where did you belong? Where did you work at? Who do you know? That was one of the tools in America that we used for rising. And the other one's been social, connect, social connections. Not in the way of, oh, let's hook someone up in this, the nepotism that we, we think about when we think about social connections, but authentic relationships. The type of relationships where, at least where I came from, when the street light came on, there was a trail of mothers and parents and cousins and uncles who could follow your way home and they would watch and call your mother before you got there and let her know before you got home what you did at someone else's house where you was at and where you shouldn't have been, what was going on, the authentic connections we had in neighborhoods. And it was also how many of us got our, our jobs. There was someone we knew who knew, who knew of an entry level position or uh, a, a job at a location. Um, they set us up, we got the interview, and we got a job. But we didn't hear about those jobs. Uh, and if it wasn't for a cousin, an uncle, a nephew, a mentor, someone who made that way, the authentic social connections. But here's the truth about those three instruments for rising in America. In most African American communities and communities of color in Boston, less than 45% of graduates of our public school graduate from high school, a school district that's made up of over 80% people of color. So in Boston, for people of color, education might not be a tool for rising. In communities and in, in across the United States, the unemployment rate has teetered around 8, 8.5. In Massachusetts, we've fared a little better. It's been in the sevens. In communities like Grove Hall, it's leveled around 30%. So Grove Hall, which is a predominantly community of color, our unemployment rate has been teetering well above 30%. So the idea of having employment or a job has not been a tool for rising. Julius Wilson in his book, When Work Disappears, talks about when there's high unemployment rates, when there is a breakdown in the school system, when there is not the social fabric that connects people together, neighbor to neighbor connections don't exist. And when those neighbor to neighbor connections don't exist, the emergence of gains and other troubles and challenges that impact the community make a community an undesirable place. And so the social connections, the very fabric of the community, that those things are the anchor tenants of jobs, schools, when they don't exist, a community social fabric is broken down. And these are the truth about rising in the 21st century. These are the truth about some of our neighborhoods in Boston. So we have these conversations where we uncover the truth. Today our, our conversation is centered about philanthropy. We have two philanthropic leaders here with us today. 
Audrey Jordan spent a long and illustrious career at NEKC Foundation where she was the director of evaluation and was really spearheading this initiative called Making Connections that thought that and believed that and proved that authentic connections amongst neighbors and communities was the fabric and the core that brought together uh, communities that could create real social change. I'm fortunate that I get to work with Audrey every day and we, she is one of my allies and part of my community here at Boston Rising. We also have Robert Lewis Jr. in his day job. He is the Vice President of Programs at the Boston Foundation, but in his nighttime job, which really is his day job if you know Robert, he's the coach of the Astros, he's a mentor to half of the people that I know in Boston, He's an overall community leader, and he's run and, and shown leadership throughout the city in many different forms, from large social service organizations to, to being one of the founders of the gang units um, in our city, or the, the gang program, initially the street worker program in Boston back in the early um, mid-80s, early 90s. So if you guys could put your hands together for our two guests. So I'm going to start us off on, um, I have five questions, so part of it was this, um, we had this, I guess, bootleg version of Behind the Actors Studio meets <laughs> something um, combination. I don't wear a turtleneck, I like to wear bow ties. I'm not as cool as the, that guy, uh, although I try to be. So I'm going to try to get through some of the questions, but just to let you know, we've never gotten through the questions, so your participation is highly encouraging. We, we, we ask you to uh, jump in um, into the conversation. And for those of you joining us um, online, uh, hashtag uh, Rising Conversations. Rising Class. Rising Class is, uh, is how you can join us on Twitter. Uh, so, the, so the first question, and these are the conversations that we've had independently and um, I know offline together. Uh, when we think about rising, um, for, uh, particularly for people of, of color in the communities, um, there's a point when Sometimes rising might mean leaving members of your community behind. And when we've asked people about what that means around disengaging with your community and no longer being a member of their community, leaving people behind, it's meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Can, can you guys talk about it? Can either one of you, um, tell me what's your reaction to that. Uh, tell me what, what's been your experience of having to leave people behind in order to rise. Well, what it, what it makes me think about it, Myra, is um, I, I recently read a book, uh, a book that I would put on the top of a list and recommend highly, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, right here in Boston, um, where she talks about the great urban migration and uh, how the little told story of millions of African Americans who moved up from the South to the North. And uh, in reading that book, it made me think about how my parents had to make the decision to leave Mobile, Alabama, uh, a, a real close-knit uh, community. Actually, it was called Pritchard, Alabama, right outside of Mobile where the, the black folks lived. And uh, my dad made the decision to move up to Milwaukee to find work on the shipyard uh, because that was where the work was. His brothers came, my mother uh, came, her brother came. So there was a small enclave of us, many, many more left in Mobile. And I think about the fact that they had to make some really hard choices, like many of those described in the book by Dr. Wilkerson, but felt a tie. So that every summer when school was out, I and my siblings would spend summer in Mobile, Alabama and have that shock of being in that southern culture, coming back to the northern culture, and having to navigate that. Even though it was really different to be there, I had those wonderful experiences of people who loved me. We would sing on the porch. We would eat gumbo. We would do all kinds of wonderful things there that I didn't do here in the north. Um, and Having met people like Bill Trainer, who is able to go back to the community where he was born and where he has family, and now build out his purpose in his life and create something like Lawrence Community Works with that special added passion of doing that in a place where he was born, where his family is, 
I don't have that kind of advantage. And it strikes me that lots of African American people may not have that advantage because we had to leave the South to find opportunity and then experience what really wasn't heaven like we thought in some ways. And um, so that's what I think about Amari and I think about sort of now growing where I'm planted, having to leave Milwaukee at some point and decide to come to the East Coast to get educated at the University of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University, having my networks now here. Now my experience in life is that my family is all over the United States because of education and jobs and where we had to go to get them. But the thing that I pine for many times is spending more time with my family and making that time, which is really hard to do. So. Yeah, I love listening to that, Audrey. I mean, especially as I think of what it was like for a young 14-year-old woman and an 18-year-old man who were legally married, my mom and dad, you know, leaving Lake City, South Carolina. And part of that is, you're both from big families, but, you know, the only one in our families that ever graduated high school were the babies, because everybody worked the field so the babies could graduate. And my, my father came here following his brother because there was a construction job and a major construction project. Matter of fact, it's where Madison Park High School is today. My father was working on a construction project right there when it was residential housing. We were the first black family moving to Maverick Street Housing Projects in 1961. So when I start thinking about sort of like, and for folks who know Boston, Boston is very neighborhood, but even more than neighborhood, Boston's very corner-centric. And a lot of folks don't know, it's like, you, you know, you could tell when someone says, yeah, I'm Dorchester, uh-huh. A Bostonian sound from Upham's Corner, I'm from Grove Hall, I mean, you know, because there's that pride. You know, so for us, it was really interesting. It was being from East Boston was a big deal. Being from Maverick was a huge deal. You know, and, you know, it's this interesting thing even today. You know, I, when you start thinking about public housing, you know, I never knew this thing that there was this thing called about economic, economic poverty. You know, you know, we went on a basketball court, there were 20 kids, it was next. We had a bike, there were 15 kids on a bike. I used to actually think when I was thinking about folks moving, I used to think the white suburban kids were poor. It's true. <laughs> Because when, whenever we were in a car and we were riding somewhere, there was always that one kid in the yard by himself. And we used to always say that poor kid. And I'm being serious because that's what we thought because we didn't know. Then moving to the South End and then moving into a Latino community, we were, I think, the eighth family that moved into Villa Victoria in August of 1976. You know, so when you start thinking about the transition, it's almost as if you go from East Boston, this Italian culture, and folks, it's not East Boston, you know today, my high school was Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> 1,500 students, 1,480 were white, and 20 were of color when I was in high school. Um, and, and it really was a Saturday Night Fever. And you start thinking about really the transition in life, and then you become a villa. I'm still, I'm 52 years old. If you ask my friends, where we're from, with a villa. The big transition was all of a sudden, I became a suit. You know, I wasn't the project kid, I wasn't the local kid. You know, all of a sudden, it's the suit. And then all of a sudden, where I feel the transition is, like, I travel. My friends don't. My friends are still the guys that hang out in Villa Victoria. And it's been a major transition. You know, my kids have graduated college, or my friends haven't. So you almost feel like you're leaving, and I was sharing with you this morning. And I'll share public. I was in a meeting with Jeff Schwartz this morning, we are talking. And I was struggling, I was crying for two hours this morning. And he asked me, he says, you know, what is it about the work we do? And I just says, it's guilt, man, I feel guilty. I says, I wear a tie. I was the first one in my family to buy a house. I have cars, my kids go to college, and there's no one in my family, or none of my friends that have any of this. And I says, while I'm walking around trying to do this work, I feel like at times am I leaving who I am behind. You know, and, and I want to figure out how the best of military and Maverick is so much a part of me. And I get afraid of losing that to be a vice president or how others treat me because I give away funding. I struggle with that. So sometimes when I start thinking about this placement, a lot of it is my soul of who I was and who I am. 
you know, and what my title in this suit and stuff gives me. So it's not a physical place, and sometimes some of it becomes even emotional in our within my own personal development, and it, it's a struggle, and I'm I'm trying to figure it out. How have how who have been the people that um, you know? I, you, you and I, and I think the three of us have had these conversations where, where we talk about the struggle between who we are and our souls and who we have to be and, and how that plays into the work that we're doing at Boston Rising around poverty. Um, you know, what, what's, been, what's been some of those critical moments that you guys have go back to that, that, to, to keep you grounded? Um, I, I mean, I have, I have tons of these moments. Are, are there some that, some that you can think about and, when you feel like you're something that you're you're losing a piece of yourself, where, where do you go back to? No, there's there's a couple of things. You know, on one end, I get frustrated, but then I I just it's an opportunity. I, you know, what keeps me grounded is like I feel like, you know, we trick the system so often that do we find ourselves believing in it? You know, my mom was a single mom, had 20, excuse me, had six kids by the age of 22. We had like six books in the house. Um, we were in the projects. We had what everyone considered nothing. We had love. <laughs> you know, so we went on to college. My brother played professional football. All those things that the system and society said we weren't supposed to have. You know, we had love. So I, I go back to the moments where my mother, who couldn't read, but had books and was teaching us to read. And if we read the same books, six books, over and over and over, we were reading. So I don't know. I mean, I think of that. The other thing, too, is you know, one of the things that I need that keeps me going is there's a story that people talk about busing, and then there's a story that us live busing. And in 1976, 20 black families were firebombed out of East Boston. We weren't bused in. We lived there. And my family was firebombed out by my best friend who was white. And this whole thing that I'm connected to busing, when I was on a bus, I lived in East Boston. And I have to go back, I have to go back to that. That keeps me moving because in some crazy way, you know, I think it was when I was 16 years old, I made a decision that I wanted to be part of something in this world that was about bringing people together that was about providing opportunities. And honestly, I didn't really know what being poor was um, until I went to college, you know. And, and, and please, I hope I'm not offending. I found out what poor was because the white kids could afford drugs. And the kids of color didn't. We didn't do drugs. We, were, we didn't have money. And it was this crazy thing of how we almost looked at drugs and alcohol and made it like a racial thing. And all the folks I grew up with in college didn't have any money. And you realize it was those that had and didn't have. And it's really funny, and you learned that because the guys that I went to school with were all working out. The guys who were white were all getting high. And, and I'm not saying that to be funny. It was one of the few times I realized the difference between supposedly who had money and who didn't have. Um, but I gotta go back to that. And you know, mom and I gotta go back to busing and going back to I think we trick people because everyone said I wasn't supposed to be here because single mom, projects, Boston Public School education and all of those factors that, there's a lot of us in the room that have stories that we've overcome that. So when I think about the events of people that grounded me, um, I have to start with um, my dad. My dad was one of those folks who um, instilled in me from a very early age this idea of the talented tenth mm -hmm. and the obligation to um, give, to lift while you climb. I mean, it was something I heard when I was six. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is your obligation, Audrey, to whom, to, to who is blessed, you know, what, what is that phrase? To whom much is given, much is expected. There you go, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I uh, had that sort of ingrained in me. But you know, as you do, you go on your journey, and um, my parents did not graduate college, so when it came, came time for me to go to college, I, uh, was advised to go to the University of Virginia, then VCU, and it was this very circuitous path. So it wasn't very planned for, it wasn't very. And I wound up having this idea at that point in time that I wanted to be a university professor mm -hmm. because I really wanted to, you know, you know, capture knowledge and, you know, kind of disseminate that knowledge to other folks and 
That was what I thought was the gold star at the time. So I remember a poignant moment I told several of you about this. And if you look at the tagline on my email, you'll see it. There's a phrase. Well, that phrase comes from an experience when I was in finishing the doctoral program, you know, and very aware because I was also working in the East End of Richmond with parents who wanted to, you know, ask and answer their own data questions. And that was always important to me as an evaluator, that participatory aspect. Mm -hmm. So one day I'm doing my thing, you know, with the parents and we're coming up with a survey and they're going to go on the street and talk to other neighbors and my boss walks in the door. She also happens to be on my dissertation committee. So I have this moment where I'm very well aware, all of y'all can relate to this, where I'm sort of straddling two worlds now. What am I going to do, right? Because on the one hand, I got this really authentic, trusting thing going on with the parents to create questions and research that is relevant to them. And on the other hand, I got my dissertation chip, my committee member coming in the room, and I know what the standard of what questions and scientific investigation are for her. And I'm like, I get a little nervous. I'm kind of like thinking, how do I navigate this? Miss Annie Jobs, at the time, she had to be 80. Didn't have any teeth in her mouth. But she was one of these community leaders, right? So she notices me sweating and, you know, squirming. And she stands up and she says, um, Dr. Bradford, you done come in the room and made Audrey nervous. <laughs> so she just calls it, and I'm like, oh, no, what's going to happen? <laughs> but she's right, in fact. And, and so my, my, my dissertation committee member boss, what do you mean, Ms. Giles? And she says, I think that Audrey's sitting here trying to figure out how she's supposed to look like she knows something to you. But you know what? We already know Audrey knows something. But you know what? What's more important is we know Audrey cares. And so for us, we need to know you care before we care how much you know. And she didn't pass that test with us. So if you don't mind <laughs> uh, understanding that and just letting us go. And in that moment, I was like, wow, that really is what's going on for me. How do I decide what's important? I decide with my heart, you know, and, and what I care about. And, I decided in relating with other people what's important is that Robert and I, we were talking about that I'm me, you know, my heart, my head, that's in it too. I don't try to put myself in a box with some standards to say this is what it means to be good and successful. That's important, can't lie, it's important. But when you got to make the decision, it's about, you know, what, what's in your heart. So that's what people connect to. That was a, a moment that defined had for me that sent me into philanthropy, thinking about getting into rooms where I can bring the heart in that room, as opposed to, do we have the best practice evidence that determines that this is what we should be investing in so we get the most return on investment? Very important, but not the only important thing. And uh, trying to remember in those rooms how to be powerful and represent that in those rooms is, is, is a struggle, but something that I strive to try to do. What, what, do you, what do you think is the truth, um, the truth about your rising story is? Like if you had to think about that story or, or your journey here, what's, what's the truth? What would, what would you tell people the truth is? The truth is that um, rising is not easy. And it's not easy for me, and it's not an individual journey. And that um, the more honest I can be about that, um, I think the more I will rise, and the more I will rise with others and realize that my rising is connected to other people's rising. Um, now that sounds real nice and neat, but it, it's, a, it's a challenge. So there are a lot of forces that encourage you to do something different if you want to be validated in other ways. Um, I want to be successful. I want to uh, gain status, I suppose, like everybody else, but I don't want to lose who I am and, and, and what I know is important. And sometimes those things don't don't jive. I know y'all are all that, you know what I'm saying. 
Ye ye yesterday on the train, um, we were talking about being black and working in philanthropy. There's a level of status that you get. There's a level of uh, reverence that people give you because either because you're associated with the resources or maybe what you say is just a little bit more important because you're giving away money. And, and I remember you saying to me uh, yesterday when we were talking about it, and some and Ron Dorsey was with us, it, it must feel like what it means to be normal in society where you don't have to worry about what people think about you because what you're saying is important and people affirm that that uh, you feel good about your job and in philanthropy you get a lot of awards for doing stuff that you didn't get when you were a practitioner. Um, could you, it, has that been your, both of your experiences in, in philanthropy and how, how do you balance that struggle of, of, of what, what you referred to yesterday as the, as the golden handcuffs uh, of philanthropy, particularly for people of color who, who get, the, get these jobs and, and perhaps don't want to leave those jobs? A couple of things, Amari, that they just resonate. I think for years the idea was how do we get folks of color in philanthropy? And we're here. There was nothing more than how do we get people of color in philanthropy? So we're here. It's almost like, you know, to a lot we've achieved what we might have set forth. I don't feel, I feel more pressure in this role than I've ever had. I'm a Boston kid, was raised by some of the great leaders in this community. I'm a project kid, which I'm proud of. When I don't fund an organization, you know, Paul Grogan doesn't get a call. I get called on if I'm from Boston or from Black, you know, or I should know better. Um, you know, folks finish at five. I live here. This isn't this isn't my job. It's who I am. I've had to make a decision around being. This is a form of being for me. Um, in these these issues and opportunities, or like a young brother said recently, you know, you don't even know my name, but you call me data and statistics. But you don't even know my name, but you call me data and statistics. And so I feel the pressure, and I think we've talked about this. You know, man, I was smart eight years ago before I put on a suit and tie, and I used to fight it. i walk in a room, I'd walk in with, you know, someone who's white in a suit and a tie, they would ask them the questions, and then they would ask me about community. Why were they smart and I was community? And, and I'll be honest, when I came to Philanthropy, you heard this, the first five meetings I had, because if anyone went, goes to the Boston Foundation, if you go to the offices, there's like, there's like class you can look in. So the first five meetings I had was Chad Gifford, um, John Fish, um, Jeff Schwartz, um, Kathy Minahan, and someone else. It was five white business leaders. And everybody who walked by paused, because everyone needed to know that I'm serious. You, you know, and this whole idea that we get boxed, or we're from Boston, or, you know, there's these things. Um, but I, I feel the pressure, but I am gonna tell you, I'm excited when I take a look at what philanthropy looks like today than when I was running nonprofits five years ago. I never seen anyone from philanthropy ever visit me when I was at City Air. When I was running BCYF, no one ever visited me. And it was this thing I've never understood how philanthropy made decisions if they were never in the neighborhood. And then we would sit down at some of the biggest issues facing our city and having community meetings. And no one from philanthropy was ever there. I just never could understand. But then as philanthropy, you know, and a lot of us got philanthropy, then, you know, some, and, you know, and I give credit to Titiana because I and her, we, we did some work back in the day on the streets. So you know what it takes. But... You know, and I, and I work for it, so I'm on the line, so if I get fired, I'll be coming y'all for a job. <laughs> but honestly, folks from Boston, when have you ever seen a meeting that Mike Durkin, Paul Grogan, Pat Brandis, um, Maureen Blade from Yaki or someone else, have ever sat in the middle of a neighborhood and had a discussion with community leaders? Can anyone tell me one meeting? I'm asking, can anyone say one? Why did they get a pass? But the expectation is, I'm at the community meeting. Amari's at the community meeting. Uh, why is the expectation of people of color are at the community meetings and none of the CEOs have to sit there and listen to community too? So, I, I mean, being long-winded, it is a pressure, but I feel like 
we're here. It's what we do in these positions. And I guess I'm going to challenge all my colleagues. You know, your title and your role, that's, you know, that's, that's just ugly what you do. Who are you? And what can we do while in these positions just to change people in place in our communities? And some of it is totally going against the cultural norms of this old Brahmin way of doing business. Philanthropy is old. It's old. And what we have created is for institutions and folks to be at the begging call to philanthropy and not solving problems, but to fund your entity. We will fail. And then our young black and brown boys will have no shot. So it's what we do in these positions, and part of it has to be that we all collectively see that we have ownership and responsibility. But again, me knowing, because I'm from here and was raised from here, there's almost this different level of expectations and pressure that I feel every quarter when we do our docket. Are, are they, are, are they in? No, no, I, I would just quickly riff off of what Robert said to say, uh, yeah, um, as a, a person of color in philanthropy, I know that philanthropy is about charity and it's about um, giving people what we think they need. And as a person of color with my own story and the story that I've seen of so many other people, I know at the end of the day that's not going to fix anything because that sets up a model that says somebody else knows what you need, you have your hand out to get it, and then you know you take that and you do with whatever you do with it. Oftentimes it doesn't fit you, your, your own experience, your own sense of possibility, you lose thinking about what you think about possibility. You gotta take the money to do what they told you it was. So I know that in that's that whole representation means when when I'm in rooms, as Randall Robinson said, I gotta get in those rooms and remember what I'm supposed to do when I'm in. And if I think that that's not right, that that model of treating people like they have to do what I think is best for them to earn my value. I gotta, I gotta disrupt that however I can. And it's one of the reasons why I was really attracted to coming to Boston Rising. We're new, we're trying to figure stuff out. We got some real wild ideas about trying to put choice and control as FII and other partners back in the hands of people who have to, have to, have to make those decisions themselves. How do we direct resources, some of the only flexible dollars around, to help make their truth about rising possible? How do we do that? That's hard to do when you're feeling like an idol and somebody who you know has to get off the script to do that in philanthropy. But we gotta we gotta figure out a way to do it, and not as individuals, but more organized and more strategic with each other. What I'm happy about is feels like we're thinking about that around the urgency of what we have to do about black boys and black and brown boys. We gotta stop playing. We gotta figure out how together we come up with something that engages the community differently to realize their own dreams, or to dream again, to pursue those dreams. And if we don't do it, then who's gonna do it? So if I can also have one piece of my to say the obligation, we now have a responsibility for me to make sure that, you know, I'm inviting Paul and Mike and others, and like Jorge and others, are convening meetings, and we're engaging and really encouraging our CEOs to be there too. Because, as I said, get in the past, but some of it has to be too, that we can't see ourselves just of the community ourselves. We need you to be walking in corporate, too. We need to make sure that we're showing, we're sharing transferable skill sets. And I think all those folks I said, I know when you get them individually in their heart, you know, they want to do this. It's just like a lot of folks, a lot of folks don't know how. And we just can't be afraid to show folks how. Um, and sometimes it goes with what Ivy just says. If you talk to moms with justice and equality, young folks, mothers with justice and equality said two things all the time. We live in a sense of emergency and urgency every day, no one else does. You know, so we almost have to get you in philanthropy to understand what urgency and emergency needs for us. And someone wants to ask, I love this, who came up with this thing that folks find every quarter? That's a fascinating discussion. Like, I don't know who came up with 
that emergency needs are every quarter when some folks need the money today to make decisions. Now, I'm not being funny, but you can talk to folks and folks on the ground know. I'll go through the process, but like, why do I have to wait four months if something that I'm building capacity is needed in you know, three weeks? So those are the things I think when we're touching it, we're, we're like, we're, we're, we're of it. And that's what we need to be is of it. And, and I know, just no, no, I got off this go point. Go I'm looking at Jorge and Jesus and people in the room who are running organizations and how we in philanthropy have just contributed to such dysfunction around the way people who need funding need to do what they need to do, but we have a march into different drummers and competing against each other. So the whole way we engage with the organizations in the community has to change. We have to be, you know, learners and co-designers and innovators and use our resources to help people cooperate, collaborate, and engage residents differently. And um, yeah, so those are the things we've got to do. And it's not going to be easy because there's a whole lot set up not to do it that way. I see a lot of head nodding and uh, some butterflies on the wall. I want to <laughs> take, a, take, a, take a, a second and see if anyone wants to jump in because we've kind of been just yeah, um, there are a couple, couple of points to make. Um, I think that you know, I, I work with Martin Hensley and we're working with Bill Strickland, who's a visionary. And I think part of the issue is, is that we have to understand that if we want a solution, we have to look like the solution. So a lot of these, a lot of the organizations that I've been around Boston, I've been around Boston a long time. If I walk in there, I don't want to be there. Okay, but some of them some real good work. So my question might be. How do we think about how do we help people look like the solution? Uh, which, is, which is one question. And the other, the other part. Do that one first, and I get back to the second one. Well, at Boston Rising, I can speak to the fact that we have a set of values that um, we we want to ground our work in, and we want to have be a compass for how we do mm -hmm. what we do. And so you are those values how you do your work, how you create opportunities for reciprocity, give, get, you know, yeah, we got funding, but what is it we're getting when you engage to be a grantee with us? And how do we have a more honest conversation about that? Um, Robert talks about this a lot. I haven't known him long. I'm so happy I've met him. And just the, the, the fact that here's a VP at a foundation who says, who am I? Who am I presenting myself as when I'm talking with people? How authentic am I? Authenticity is a, a really important piece of what we do. So it is very much about what the space is like. When you come in, you come in here, I hope you can see the openness, the idea, the, the flexible space, the idea that you know people don't have permanent fixtures or yeah, um, it's important. It's important to a feeling of welcoming, coming in. Uh, Feeling like you know we're open to something different. We didn't we didn't ask you to come in and you know feel like you were in some place that was uncomfortable to you. I'll just put it that way. Um, yeah. The, the other part is I think that you know we're so busy trying to get somewhere, and then especially the young people we're working with, they're trying to get there too. Okay, wherever that is, they get there and realize what you get me into. You know, so I think we have to have a better way of being more authentic with allowing people to develop on their own, okay, and seeing that there are lots of possibilities as opposed to just the direction we're trying to take them. You know, one of the things that I, I always love to do, right, because young people, man, it's just too power. Do we know their names? Mm -hmm. I want someone to tell me their names, where they live in their stories. So, you know, we do this for Street Safe, and I did it with some of our success Boston cohorts. What they say they need versus what we say they need, we're in two different planets. Mm -hmm. They don't know us. We, we don't know them as much as we say. We know data and statistics. So when a young brother turns around and says, what I need is a father figure, somebody who holds me too, we fund mentoring programs. That's about the mentor. Young brothers are saying we need a father figure. Two things that young man said, you know, said to me just recently. He says, you know what's one of the things that I love about some of the guys I work with? It's the first time in my life I know I can call somebody, I can ask the question on things that I just never knew where to get the answer. 
And I think on my cell phone, I got 500 people. I do this every day. And a young person didn't have anyone to call, and we're asking them to be successful when we've never shown them what success looks like. Mm -hmm. What we keep telling them is what they do or don't do. The second thing is, is was anyone at the Council on Foundations in California last couple of weeks ago? We went out, and for anyone that knows, I literally took our delegation from Boston, and we spent time with the Blood Set and Nickerson Garden with the Crip Set and Jordan Downs and with the Mexican Mafia in the Valley. And ask these young dudes, you know, you know, there's this world you're living in. So tell me about it. And dude said something profound. Says, why we do this? This is the only group who ever said they would die for me. Wait, 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 hold for a second. He said, my mom never said she would. My dad never said. A teacher never said. These guys here said they would die for me. And I'm looking to belong. Or if anyone was at the conference a couple of weeks in Washington, D.C., a young brother got up and shocked the room and says, I'd rather be wanted for murder than to be unwanted. At least somebody's looking for me. Arnie Duncan was there, Eric Turner. You know, and our politicians are great, right? Dudes were buckling. <laughs> be because what we didn't do is if, if we listen to what they're saying and we get and we start paling this, they want to belong. They want to be listened to. There's, there's answers to this. You know, no disrespect if I offend folks. You know, this is what I do. We have more job <laughs> training. But no, we have more job training programs training folks, and we don't have enough programs to get kids jobs. There's something twisted about this, that we have more job training programs training folks for no jobs. And we're funding them. I'm funding them. Then I meet somebody crazy who's not a 501c3 who's figured out a way to get kids jobs. They said, hey, I can teach you how to umpire. You can do little league games. You can do softball games. You get 35 bucks a game. This whole summer, I can put $6,000 in your pocket just by learning how to umpire. And this person isn't a 501c3, doesn't get funded, but gets 75 kids jobs. But I'm funding millions of dollars training programs that a lot of kids aren't getting jobs. So I say this because I think part of this, Bill, is when it's a collective action of us listening to. I think we need to know their names. We really need to make sure that some funding is following the young folks. We're really getting them the services they really need, and not as much of us just funding, because no disrespect, some CEOs, when you go to a board meeting, what's the first two questions that your board asks you? How are we doing around revenue, and how are we doing around budgets? Quality needs to jump up, and that's what we really actually need to be investing in. So Robert, I got a solution to your problem. I'll talk no, to you. No, it's not my problem. It's our problem. <laughs> no, that's it. It's our problem. I'm like, I'm like, it's our problem. I'm like kidding. Chris Mulvey, Chris Mulvey from Boston Rise. Robert, you mentioned that um, when you think back um, at philanthropy, it's changed a lot. And looking back at it from the seat you are today, it's been a dramatic change. Um, one day I want to be in a seat like yours and look back and say the same thing, because I don't think we're there yet. I agree. I don't think we're where we want to be. How do you think we get there? Here's the funniest thing, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I look back five years ago and I look at you know, public charities, I even look at corporate. When you look at Bethia, Tulane, you look at you know, Heidi Brooks, um, Mona Lisa, some of you, they weren't there. And, and, and it's something, and then again, and I'll, and I'll be arrogant for a second. See, I live this thing that I have an open door policy. Once I'm in, you come with me. So if you've seen the foundation five years ago and you see it now, I didn't make any diversity hires. I hired great people, because I don't believe in this thing you can't find great people of color. You know, you know, we turn around and we fund and invest in two young brothers that are developing something around building the next generation of leaders. And I know it's one of the first things I was saying to Jesus, and when I said Amari, I said, go get funding, go get folks and we'll fund it. I get Amari, Machilia, Natanya, Selvin Chambers, Andrea, um, I was thinking about this thing, Melanie Damsker, Ray Janko, Mathiah Carter. Um, and I'm thinking about folks, and I hope folks don't mind. Hey, Sus, these are folks I meet with regularly. And uh, can I say something? Can I speak? I meet with them regularly. I make sure my philanthropy follows them. I bring them in the door. I'm hoping to give them opportunities to lead. Because if we don't do it, it it's not going to happen. And I know, again, and I'm not trying to, Tiziana and I were talking about this, 
And you know, and I'll give her credit. And you know, and I hope I can say this. With I know Tiziana was like when she came in, a lot of folks in the community were like thinking, you know, somebody of color is going to get hired, right? Not Tiziana. Everyone's like we were disappointed, right? Because there was this thing, oh, we're going to hire someone of color, you know. So we can take our disappointment and we can live on that for a while. But she was hired. <laughs> or we can turn around and say, what's Tiziana going to do now that she's in that role? And I'm looking around this room and like, wow, look at what she's doing now she's in that role. There has to be a moral obligation for us that are in these positions to do this. And what you have to do is don't ask me in this seat, fight for it. Because to be blunt honest with you, I'm smart enough to know I'm only a couple years away from someone like you ready to take this spot. And I better stay great in this. So what I do is I give this seat up. They don't take it from me. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I tell folks in philanthropy, my brothers and sisters out there, why are you asking me to give you a pass when your proposal sucks? If you do what you need to do, all I want to do at the end is validate it. Because I'll tell you as quickly as anything, I'll be out this position, and I can't, show, I can't be sure that the program department will look the way it does within the next five years. So let's keep fighting. And let's not be afraid to tell high school students and college seniors about philanthropy. I fell in this. <laughs> you know, I just think it's a great profession and actually it's very underrepresented on a national level of, of people of color, you know, throughout our country. I think the companion piece to what Robert said, and, and if I could just characterize for contrast with Robert, it's about who's in philanthropy and bringing more people of yes. color and people of passion and purpose into philanthropy. Then the, the other question is what philanthropy does. Um, it, as it engages with organizations and community and actually funds and invests in things. What I'd like to see in five years, um, Chris Maldi, is that um, there's a better understanding of what it really truly means to get to sustainability and scale. And that's not about looking at some numbers to decide this these are the quality of life improvements that we'll invest in with these programs and then somehow after we leave, fairy dust is going to hit and on the <laughs> We know that what it's about is investing in the capacity of the people who live, work, and worship in these communities if you seriously mean sustainability. Those are the folks who got the ideas and the investment, the, the, the passion, the networks that we've got to invest in and understand that as a part of what the funding is if we mean sustainability, because those folks are going to be there when we're, late, when we're gone, when our 10-year initiative is over. <laughs> they're the ones that are there, and they're going to be doing the work. So if we help build capacity, help them work together better, help them learn, help them have results, the benchmarks, the milestones they can hold themselves and each other accountable to, philanthropy will have done some good things. But while we have this model now of having the right answer, going in while we're there, assembling the deck, making sure people are doing what we think they need to do, and then looking up 10 years later and saying, you no, know, we didn't get there. We didn't get to scale. We don't have sustainability. Oh, well, okay, let's call that one over. Let's try something in another community. That, that can't be the model. Mm -hmm. no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so two things. First, this is going to sound like I'm being facetious. I'm not. I want to thank you both for the opportunity to reflect on all the ways I still suck and need to get better. <laughs> You've given a lot of that today. And it's really actually very helpful, right, to have that mirror held back up. And you can see some progress in some places. But you're hitting pretty hard some important points about ways that I, we, lots of us are still, despite our good intentions, we still got a lot of practices. I'm actually really grateful for that. Robert, when you said, um, I've been really haunted for the last few days by a piece I read in Michael Sandel's new book. And um, something you said brought it back for me again. You talked about we always look first at revenue and expense and less on quality. And Sandel's got a new book out that's basically arguing that we're in this dangerous point, and I'm going to cause all kind of hoopla by putting this on streaming, um, where we're moving from a market um, function to a market culture mm -hmm. and that there's a pretty big difference between moving from a market economy basically to a full market culture where your culture now reflects all the values of the economy mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking a ton about that 
and thinking that that, I think that's true and I think it has profound effect on how we think about something like philanthropy, which really was rooted in a different culture, right, in a different set of values. Um, now, I don't even know what to say about that and I've been thinking about it for five days and now I'm thumping it on the table for the two of you and saying, so what do you think of that? But I'm going to do that anyway. What do you think of it? You know, does it resonate with you in any way? Because it's really been sitting heavily on me in the last few days since I, since I read it. I'm interested if, if you have reactions. Either. So when you, I, I would just like to ask a clarifying <coughs> question. What alarms you about the shift that you see? Can you can you give me a more tangible vision? Of well, that? you know, uh, in in my public policy education, we were always taught that the market is beautifully designed to maximize the individual good, uh, but that that's its only mech function is maximizing <coughs> individual good. And when you have public challenges, public problems, a community. Markets aren't built for that because that's communal good. And so if we're moving to a point where it's not just a mechanism, but our entire culture is imbued with values that are designed to maximize individual good uh, and not collective good, that's scary because we actually live as humans. This is Rousseau at its basis, right? We live as a collective. That's the whole point. Otherwise, what we get is what he said, nasty, brutish, and short, right? So that's why it troubles me. But that helps. No. I think there's a couple of things, again, I don't know if it answers your question. Um, and again, I, I have this crazy thing, and someone should try this. You know, at, at 501, when you're sitting down having coffee, root beer, a drink, or dinner, man, you're as, as close to truth to power and having all the answers, and then 9 to 5, we don't act that way at all, <laughs> which is a very interesting one. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is, it, at night, I'm talking about the dropout rate, violence, disparities in health care, unemployment, which we said, but if I say 16 to 30 year old, black or brown, it's even higher. Lack of opportunities, mentorship. And I think of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. And that's what we're doing for FY13 planning. But in 1960, it was the same thing. But we're doing this for FY13 planning. But what we're celebrating are these things in sectors called the public sector, the private sector, the social entrepreneurs, and this, that, and the other. And I almost think that it's almost like we're creating this sectoral base of trying to please folks versus solving problems. So we have this thing in Boston, and let's call it. There's a whole issue between social entrepreneurs and folks in the community. Everyone's talking about it, and the social entrepreneurs are being funded out the roof, and the folks in the community are pissed off. And we're not talking about it because then all of a sudden, is it around the young people that we're trying to change, or is it around this thing with building scale of institutions? With a lot of institutions that are getting money to build scale and then taking it from here. And I'm not being critical, I work for two of them. So I don't know the answer, except there's something to me that people in place aren't at the center. Mm -hmm. the sto in, in, in some may notice from a violence perspective, over the last 40 years, 88% of the streets in Boston have never had one shooting or killing. 88% of the streets in Boston, over the last 30, 40 years, have never had one shooting or killing. 12% of the streets in Boston have had all the shootings and killings. But we have a citywide strategy. <laughs> the other performing schools are in Rockford, Dorchester, back then. And we have a citywide strategy. We can't even say black or brown. And we're wondering what, and no disrespect, we bought into it. Because we're, so here's the flip side is, I don't know the answer, but what would happen collectively if we turned around and said Rockford, Dorchester, Mattapan? The tipping skill for us to just get a tip is about 5,000 young black and brown boys, mm -hmm. and we can do more. But 5,000? What would happen if we did that and there was a collective action around public, private, social entrepreneurs, this, that, and the other, we came together? We changed the city. Two miles. Two miles is all we're talking about. But all these other things are coming in, we're investing our time and energy. Doesn't get to the answer, but I just think what we're doing is we're getting nonprofits to buy into our grant making processes, 
we're competing on social entrepreneurs and this, you know, where, you know, turn around and say we have a return on investment, which has become the culture. What's the return on community? Where's the ROC with the ROI? You know, because all of these things have to come to bear. And I think the great book is going to be, damn, 40 years from now. Wasn't that crazy for 100 years we couldn't figure that out? And we sat down and had some conversation. And instead of any of us saying what we give out a year, Boston collectively and philanthropy is putting its $2 billion to work. What would that say if we said Boston's philanthropy put its $2 billion to work? Hmm. So just three quick responses um, that I think will riff off what Robert said. Um, I think we wade into territory that suggests that we don't have to pay attention to the effects of accumulated advantage and accumulated disadvantage. People in your scenario who already have money are going to be the ones who make more money and, and those who don't won't. It'll get worse. I think we have evidence of the, the curve, the 1%, the 99%. Um, to me, it means that two things have gone terribly awry, and we have contributed to it in philanthropy, and that is that money or capital, financial capital, becomes the measure of value. And then all the other capitals don't have value, the social capital, the human capital. How is it that we're in this place? And in philanthropy, we don't realize that we've got to use the money to help those, the value of those other capitals rise. So that's that, those couple points. And then there's a point that Angela Glover Blackwell brought up yesterday in a meeting we were at. And we've been wrestling with this question at Boston Rising. You know, at the end of the day, if we want people to feel interdependent, the truth is the folks who are dependent need us to feel that way. But those who are wealthy don't really need us to feel that way. So what is the value proposition for those who have to care about the interdependence of all of us? That's a tough one, right? And we, we wrestle with that so that there's as much of a benefit to caring about that for people who don't need to care. And she raises this concept called collateral dividends that may be a clue for us. And it's this idea that Sort of like you saw when the uh, Americans for Disabilities Act really took hold and stuff started changing where curves on the sidewalk got slanted so that people on wheelchairs could get up the curves of the sidewalk. And there was a lot of resistance to doing that initially because it was targeting something to where the need was, right? Well, how can we spend all this money just because people have to you know, get up the curve on a wheelchair? Well, the collateral dividend aspect of this is how many times are you happy to have that little curve there because you're pushing a stroller or you're um, riding a bike or you're rolling your suitcase? So the idea that, okay, yeah, maybe we targeted what we were doing for Americans with disabilities, but look how all the rest of us benefit. If we can figure out ways to continue to make that case better in philanthropy and direct some funding to that, then we win the interdependence piece because without that, we're stuck in this individual, you know, this individual success based on how much money I have. And that's a problem. I'm gonna let answer or ask my last question to, to wrap us up. I'm getting the uh, the horn. The Sandman's coming out if you if you watch Showtime at the Apollo. Are you to still rise? And if so, how are you rising? What what are your last words on that today for us? I'm always rising when there are other people who are still trying to rise. I don't define my success in rising by where I am. I'm looking at where we are. And to just harken back to my earlier comments, it's a struggle to be your authentic self mm. in places that um, reinforce and incentivize you to do otherwise. So yes, I'm still rising. Um, absolutely. First of all, it's great to rise in the morning. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Woke up this morning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm serious. You know, it's like, how are you doing? I'm great. You know, I have two feet on the ground. You know, this gives me an opportunity to do something today. Um, no, really. I mean, you know, absolutely, you know, continue to rise. And, um, you know, and I appreciate all of you saying that to me, it's still struggling to be authentic and to be real. Real for real, as Reverend Rivers said, can be real for real. And you know, and I and there's this crazy thing that um, you know, 
every day is like living between the dashes. You know, I'm like, you know, you know, I may not be here, but what's that story? Like from when I came and when I left, and I hope it's about who I am and not what I did, you know? Um, so like, I feel like I, I love this opportunity to live between the dashes because it's generational. You know, I'm a part of my, my, the historical aspect of my family. I'm a representative of my late mom and dad. My kids will continue. And man, and you know, we're, we're rising. And, 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 and if there is one thing with everything um, that was said, it crazy as it sounds, I believe from the fabric of my soul, because of the people I work with or know in this community, that it will be different. I, I just, because if I can't, then my journey's done. So we almost rise. We almost rise. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us on this uh, this wonderful conversation today. Um, it's, it's been powerful and, and moving for me. I hope it was for all of you who are here today. Uh, we have another conversation next week. Uh, I will not be moderating that conversation. Um, our, our very good friend, Jesus Serrano from FII, will be moderating that conversation, the conversation between Claudio Martinez, who is on the school board, as well as uh, one of the founders of High Square Task Force, and Vanessa Rosado Calderon, who is uh, the leader of EVA and also on the uh, Massachusetts Board of Education. It will be a conversation that will be all in Spanish. Uh, for those who don't speak Spanish, earphones and translations will be provided. Um, but we really want to illustrate and be clear about the truth for rising, um, including rising folks' native tongue in their own language. So please join us for that conversation. Thank you for coming today. Uh, the conversation doesn't have to be over, uh, although the formal kitchen cabinet talk is over. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful and blessed day. <laughs>